I've been really well, thank you. Uh, obviously, the strike, we took 10 months off or whatever it's been, but I just started on a new show this past week, so <laughs> everything's looking up. That's awesome. That's awesome. But, which kind of brings me to the point of Brothers. Uh, so in the project that you worked on, that finished uh, earlier last year before the strike, I'm assuming, the post-production rate? or Yeah, I mean, it's it. it I think... Um... The strike started in May or something, and I think I, I might have stayed until April or something like that. But we had we had the lion's share of the work done. Obviously, there was no shooting after the strike started. We had finished yeah. self-shooting. Yeah, wonderful. What are you working on now, unless it's uh, not supposed to be revealed? No, it's fine. Uh, I, I worked a, a lot uh, on and off with John Wells, and I'm working on a new John Wells show. It's for uh, MGM+. Plus. It's called Emperor of Ocean Park. Um, okay. it's, been, it's, uh, it's got Forrest Whitaker. It's going to be great. Oh, great. I, I love Forrest Whitaker. I think he's a yeah. great actor. He Wonderful. Uh, well, you know, I spoke to Kim um, uh, uh, about Miles. A couple, yeah, Kim Miles a couple of weeks ago. I spoke to him once before, too, uh, about his work on Welcome to Marvin with Robert Zemeckis. Uh, but yeah, we spoke uh, just, I think, just before Christmas. And uh, I had a great time watching the series. And, you know, something that I really enjoyed was, and again, it's the, you know, in, in editing and cutting, it's all about um, cutting without knowing that there's a cut, invisible editing. Yeah. Um, and there was a, and there was a lot of that in this series. So I wanted to kudos, give you kudos on that, that it, there was a lot of elements that I, you know, didn't even, I got so involved in characters, obviously that's a credit to writing as well, that you forget about all those nitty gritty cuts and stuff and, and yeah. you enjoy, enjoy it way more. Yeah, well, that, that's that's great to hear. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, the uh, that's always my goal, you know, is to be, well, I mean, it, it's to propel story. And so as much as that allows me to just sort of hide edits and make us, you connect to the characters and move with the characters, that's uh, the most important thing. And then, of course, with fighting, it's so, uh, I listened to your um, your interview with Kim and okay. uh, you 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 know, it, it's really nice to hear when people are sort of appreciating the filmmaking for, for, you know, some, some stuff that's actually very hard to do, like staying wide in fight scenes and, uh, and trying to make it feel like you're in the room with them. And, uh, uh, while at the same time ratcheting up the tension and making those, uh, the impacts be really be felt. So, um, uh, it was nice to hear. Yeah, no. And I, Again, I don't know if I mentioned this in the conversation I had with Kim. I know I say it a lot of times here and there, but I lose track who have said this. Of thing. course. One thing that one thing I, I feel like it's kind of coming back aside from this, you know, the practical effects, which the audience is appreciating more than the CGI. Like that's a big sure. conversation. Now, I think it's also the I don't know if P, the audiences know that, but I mean, me, myself being in the industry, I, I notice it and I appreciate it more. The element of the the idea of wider shots, which you mentioned, where you just feel that everything is authentic, you know, in, in a lot of I think one of the worst examples, I, there's I'm a huge fan of the original Predator movie. Obviously, a lot of people are or no Schwarzenegger one. They made yeah. a recent, uh, not the, the last one, not Prey, the one after that, they made some version and it was garbage. The movie was absolutely terrible. But one of the things that they did in that was really bad was too many close-ups and way too many cuts. I had no idea what the hell was going on. Like you don't even feel yeah. for anybody. But yeah. now I think that's coming back and your show is one of those examples, you know, that that is kind of bringing that back slowly. And I think people are appreciating it way more. Yeah, I hope so. You know, I mean, certainly filmmakers, the the on the production side and editorial, um, I'm finding that uh, the showrunners and even the networks are responding to that in a way that maybe in the past, you know, generally it's the networks that are pushing you towards closer and closer and closer. They're concerned about people looking down at their iPad, maybe missing what's going on. And, um, but I'm finding that uh, I'm getting, I've always pushed wider um, and I'm getting the note less to climb in. <laughs> so that's great. Good, good. I'm going to come back to the series uh, in a bit. I want to always go back and find out about the journey everybody goes through to be where they are today, right? And sure. uh, before you start even talking about that, the very first thing that if you can remember, what was the catalyst in you coming in this direction of storytelling, whether it was another department or not, what began all this journey? 
That's a great question. I, you know, it's, uh, I've always, I've always liked the, you know, I was a math major and an English major in college. And so it, it, you can sort of almost, almost immediately see my resume saying, oh, editing sounds great for you. <laughs> you know, um, I did go to film school and I had a great editing professor. And at the time, um, I probably, if you were to ask me that day, I probably would have said, oh, uh, I, my prefer, my preferred role is to be a director. And um, I've directed stuff and I've been able to got, get opportunities to direct in television and shows I've worked on. Um, and I really do enjoy it. Um, but I also feel perfectly at home and it really feel connected to the editorial work. And it's incredibly satisfying to me even after 25 years. I've been able to move between documentaries and um, uh, news and uh, reality television and scripted television. So. Uh, and I've enjoyed all of it. So um, that's a real testament to my love of actually making cuts and crafting a story uh, in that way. And so I, um, the, the way I got started started is that I had a terrific editing professor at school. And, um, and he put his arm around me and said, hey, man, come in the edit bay, be my assistant, you know, come sit, sit at the end of my desk and just watch me interact with producers, see how I do this. And one of the producers was sort of like self-conscious and she was looking around and, and she was like, do you, do you really get a lot out of being in the room when it's just us? And I'm like, oh yeah, absolutely. So she was, she was great too. You know, you need to have everyone sort of be on board. You know, I think that if she were to have her druthers, I, I wouldn't have been there, you know? And so, uh, and, uh, and, and I was so lucky that I was able to stay in that room and get a sense of it. And so that when he was able to throw some work my way and other producers would ask him who could, hey, who, you got a young guy who could help. And so uh, I think three years he kept me alive, just throwing me work on wow. the side. And that really got me started. And that was in Boston and, and at, at a, uh, a network called WGBH, which does a lot of the, um, a lot of the mm -hmm. natural, national PBS stuff. So I, 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 got my, I cut my teeth there. Wow, that's incredible. It's good to have someone backing you like that. And yeah. obviously, you know, there's a lot of effort involved in your part to be able to sustain that because some people may not be able to. But nevertheless, just having that backup is is really, really important. And, and one thing you talked about editing and directing, I, I you know, they go hand in hand. It's funny because I I enjoyed both, but I think I'm at that point now in my life where I right now in that stage where I prefer directing over editing yeah. and i think that mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do with your personality too you know yeah. because one of them is one of them is an introvert job and the other one is an extrovert job like essentially that's what it is um, yeah. and sometimes you like to feel like a homebody but the thing is they both go hand in hand because if you know how to edit and you're directing you know what to get and then if yeah. you know the other way around works the same way um, yeah. what what is there an example where you realize that very quickly that they go hand in hand because the film is written in three different places, right? The writing, directing, and editing. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, especially in reality television, when I was, you know, I, I after being in Boston, I moved down to New York and started cutting, um, at the time it was called like ride along shows and they'd be like doctor shows and you'd be in the ambulance of the people. And you just, you had to just take the reins as you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you know, you just have to take the reins in editing and, uh, and you really are crafting the story in the bay and so that was a that was that was such a that that really like strengthened my storytelling my specifically storytelling uh skills um and uh and so and that was also one of the things that was so rewarding so like i said like in in school i you know i was like oh yeah i definitely want to direct and so i really felt like i was i was really such a part of both aspects of filmmaking in the edit bay that I was getting both my, how am I going to craft this? What are my storytelling? Like, how am I going to cut my teeth with my storytelling ideas? And, you know, turning around and saying, hey, do we have stuff like this that we could sort of help this uh, story point? And do we have stuff like that? And hey, could we get some stock footage that might do this? Um, and so so it was really, you know, in, in those formative years of first just becoming a professional editor, also being given, you know, back then, <clears throat> excuse me, back then with the, um, with it, reality TV in its infancy, they really just, they would just drop footage on editors and just pray that that stuff would come out as broadcast looking <laughs> stuff. And so if you could do that, and I could, you know, you, 
they'd they just open doors for you. They'd be like, yeah, great. Let's, let's set him, let's just throw him some more footage. Let's throw him some more footage. And when you want to prove yourself, that's, there's nothing better than that, than being able yeah. to get that opportunity. And, and, uh, and then, and, 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 and be able to do it quickly. Like you do it, you press play. Someone walks in the room, sits down, you press play. And they're like, ah, oh, that's great. <laughs> you know, and that's that instant feedback as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was, that's, that's really where I got excited about it. That's so cool, man. Um, you know, on this project uh, that you got that you gone uh, got on, how did you get onto this project? Like, was it through connections or was it just a, a application? Like, what was the process yeah, of you sure. getting onto this project? Well, well, I had the great luxury of having gone to high school with uh, the showrunner. And uh, that's one of the that's one of the easiest. If you want to get a job in Hollywood, that's one of the best ways to do it. But Brad Falchuk and I went to high school together. So we've known each other since we were 15. And, um, and we even worked together um, 10 years ago on a show called Nip Tuck, which was for FX. And mm -hmm. he was a writer on that show. And, um, and he introduced me to Ryan Murphy, who was the showrunner of that show. And Ryan Murphy hired me. And uh, so I cut on that show for a few seasons. And, um, and so we worked together on the same show. And then I went on to, you know, have my career moving around and with many other showrunners. And he went on with Ryan Murphy and created all sorts of television shows that, you know, are all over the place. And then this was his first show. He and Ryan, um, Brad has gone on to move on to just make shows for himself. And so mm -hmm. this is Brad's first show. And, uh, and so I was having dinner with him and we were talking about it. And I was, I, I just let him know that I really wanted to help, you know, support him in, in any way I can. And so he, you know, we, we, I got on the show with him and, uh, I met Byron and, uh, and, and it went, went from there. That's so cool, man. And, you know, when you, when you got onto this show, was there any kind of, I mean, you've done Nip Talk, which was, you know, a very popular show and it was, it ran for a lot of seasons. It was a great series. I, I think I've seen a couple of seasons. Um, uh, but this was something different, right? It's it's a, it, it just has a different tone to it, which you obviously probably felt too. But how was it something challenging in terms of dealing with something different of this nature? Or had you done something similar before? Oh well, I mean, you know what's, you know, I've been really lucky, you know. So I've I've cut uh, comedy dramas like Shameless for Showtime, and uh, and so that does that where you sort of are trying to move quickly between really heartfelt drama and really zany comedy. So I had done at that aspect before. I had worked on action shows before. I worked on a show called Animal Kingdom for TNT and mm. uh, The Last Ship also for TNT, which were sort of like heavy testosterone action shows. And so I, I I'd cut a lot of. I'd cut a lot of action, I'd cut a lot of comedy, I'd cut a lot of drama. And so moving into this world where where we were trying to meld the three um, was really exciting. And it's one of the reasons why this was such an, which was such an exciting project to get to be a part of, because one, um, it's martial arts. And that's like, that's a different type of, uh, of action. And action, it's just yeah. so intimate and it is so much fun. And then to try to add a, and, and, um, the stunt coordinator did such a great job of adding sort of comedy in it. You know, I even heard Kim speaking with you about it, just sort of trying to add the Jackie Chan sort of comedy in amongst the um, the intense physicality. And so being able to try to make sure that we maintain that tone as well. And uh, and then you are taking really hard turns. I mean, there's a lot, of, there's a huge body count, you know, <laughs> and that's, and that's, so it's hard to balance the big body count with, the light comedy as well. And so the, all those challenges uh, are what make cutting something like this really exciting. Yeah. There, there are certain movies that I see and certain soundtracks that I listen to before I start a new project. Was there any particular project that, that you saw just to kind of get into that vibe, that environment? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you again. I mean, not, not to keep referring to the other interview, but uh, you know, you you nailed it when you said you watched it and you were like, "Oh, this I, I'm feeling I'm feeling Kill Bill vibes." You know what I mean? And there's yeah. like, no one does intense, extreme violence with comedy like Tarantino, and yeah. he and also I'm 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 fifty ish years old. Uh, you can't not be my age and not be um, inspired by Quentin Tarantino's work. And so obviously those, and even, you know, the Scorsese of it all as well. Like, you know, we did a lot to maintain that tone 
this is an Asian American story. This is a, um, but it is not scored exclusively in that tone and in that vein. So we took world music, we took songs from everywhere, tones from everywhere to put in amongst this story in a very Tarantino Scorsese musical way. Angela Sistio was great. She gave us this big, big, big playlist at the very beginning of it all. And, um, and hours and hours and hours of music to listen to that puts you in the vibe of sort of bubblegum pop um, Asian culture. But at the same time, it was also, you know, sprinkled in with all sorts of other stuff from all over the world, which was a lot of fun. So I think that was sort of tonally where we were all coming from. And I think that's where Byron and Brad wanted, always wanted to be. Yeah, no, that that's, that's so, that's so good that you guys did that because like, I mean, like we've talked about this before, like it was just, it, it just had an eighties and nineties vibe, but you know, awesome stuff, man. And, and, you know, when you're editing something like this or anything for that matter, there's always challenges that you come in. Like there's always a scene where, or maybe more than one time, a scene where you're like, okay, I don't know how to do this as in like you don't know but how should i do it like should i do it this way or that way and sometimes there is you know the heads that butt around between the director and editor for the sake of a better product or better film or series was any event like that occurred where you guys had sort of this creative disagreement and how you overcame that yeah you know i i i, I it's so funny it was such a collaborative and um communal experience uh, you know so i work with my assistant shannon lynch there was another team ryan chan and um allison chang and evita zhu and uh, dora wu and so having not only like them every every time we'd have a full cut we'd invite all the other editorial teams in um and watch the show together and, you know, you just get there and you sit there and you'd, you'd be watching Dora watch this bit or you'd be watching Ryan watch this bit and you would just see how they were responding to it. And then we'd all have that conversation. You'd start asking them about what were you thinking about this? What were you thinking about that? And so and then you get to the directors and then you get to your producers and everybody was just all we were all just rowing in the same direction, just trying to make it more interesting, more fun. And uh, and, and make sure that the story was clear, you know, and so that was so was there. I don't think there was ever a point, even with even if we had disagreements, you know, if if, if I had one feeling and Kevin, uh, the director, had another feeling, it would always just it would just be like, well, which one's cooler? Which one's more fun? How could we make yeah. this? Well, what if we did it this way? And it was always that that was the dance that everyone was doing in the entire team. So it was just a lot of fun. And I think that shows in the series because you feel that, you know, when you oh good, you know, that in any kind of project it doesn't have to be in the, in, in the film world or series world when things work together collaboratively in, in a team the, it shows when things don't that shows as well and this yeah. one did show that there was that collaborative effort even with the characters right like everybody was sort of had their own thing that they were bringing into the show yeah well, yeah we we're really lucky so you know especially to coming out of um coming out of covid uh you know, it was important to Kevin to have us, he was the executive producer as well as the director of many, not all, but many other episodes. And he, um, he asked that the editorial team be on the lot. So we were on the same lot where they were shooting and they did shoot sort of 50, 50, or maybe 60, 40 off the lot as well as on, but it allowed us to be around. We would have lunch with the crew. We would swing by set. Kim was always welcoming us down to set and, uh, and, and excited to see us come sit down and, we would either be talking about some scene we just cut or do we have a piece that might do this or asking about what was being shot for the day and having lunch with the actors and having lunch with this with the um, stunt group seeing them practice the fights in there in, in they had this um, a rehearsal hall um, so that all of that it just made everyone feel a part of everything and it gave everyone the ownership everyone felt ownership of the entire series so especially because, you know, not, not, not let alone the fact that it was multilingual and I only speak one language, you know, so I had to rely on Mo Lin Liu, who was our post PA, who is from China. And so I would cut a scene and just invite him in and say, Hey man, 
do you understand what they're saying? <laughs> like, I wouldn't know what they were saying. I'd be like, how does this work? And he would watch and he'd be like, that's very good, but she doesn't say that line very well. And I'd be like, oh, really? He's like, no, no, no. And I'd play the other takes and he'd be like, that one's good. And so I would put that one in. And so everybody top to bottom were, had a voice and were welcomed into the edit bay and onto, like I said, onto set and everywhere to contribute to the project. You know, it's funny you mentioned that almost everybody that I've spoken to in the last year, whether it's uh, especially editors like uh, uh, Richard Francis, who's done Shawshank Redemption and Green Mile. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm just kind of escaping the names right now. But pretty much everybody who said who's the film that we were talking about that made a lot of um, critical buzz or commercial buzz or both specifically had the same kind of setup where the editors were on the location That's and that creates that creates such a team and like you said the key word is ownership like you feel like yeah. you're part of this project as opposed to oh here is the footage you know yeah and then you go in your room and you start there's not that connection you don't even know who these people are you don't know what's going on you're just in the room and editing with your team and that's it so that yeah. i think that that is a big thing and i and I probably, again, one of the few things, reasons that this worked among yeah. many other. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 I fully believe that. And, and, uh, and the cast, the cast themselves, you could just witness it. You could see that all of them had that same bond, you know, always open arms with everyone else and always within their own, um, in their own departments also being really connected. So, uh, yeah, it was, it's definitely special for that reason, for sure. Yeah. What was something that you enjoyed cutting? This, the fight this scenes. Had... I mean, period. Fight. Answer. Well, listen, obviously, favorite scene, Michelle Yeoh, Justin Tian, um, their first seeing each other after 20 years or 30 years. That was just so exciting to cut. That was the first cut. That was the first scene I cut with Michelle. And you're just like, ah, oh. I mean, are you kidding me? This is fantastic. And so I loved cutting that. And I think the same day I got that kitchen, um, the kitchen fight scene with the giant. And mm. so I was cutting, I was cutting fun action. I was, I was cutting Michelle Yeoh. I was cutting drama. I was cutting emotion. There was comedy in there. And, uh, and so that was, I mean, that's the one that just literally just jumps right to my head, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know Michelle Yeoh was incredible. I mean, she looks exactly the same Michelle Yeoh as I saw in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. She's so good. What was yeah. it? What? 25 years ago? Almost? Uh, more uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, her, there's that scene of her where, um, I, I I'm really bad with characters name, but when she is kind of held captive and she just does not budge, she does not give any kind of weakness away. And I think that performance of her in that scene was absolutely remarkable. Yeah. She was great. You know, so like I said, there was three, there was three teams. Um, there was Evita, Ryan, and myself were the three editors on the show. And we each got a great Michelle scene to cut it out of the multitude of episodes. And it was just, I mean, all of us were so excited every time we got to work on her stuff. So she's, she's just fantastic. And yeah. so sweet. Like, you can't even believe it how nice she is. <laughs> so it's just, it's just, you know. I'm gushing a little bit and uh and I think it's also a speaks to, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. And so if I'm gushing, it means that this was really a special project. Yeah, no, 100% and I think it was good <laughs> to see Michelle. I think everybody was great. You know, that and that rarely happens that it it was just the character again, it, everything goes back to story and characters. They were just written and fleshed out so well that you know, the actors had to obviously work hard, but probably not as hard because they were just written so well that everything kind of clicked. And that's yeah. what makes a great story. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other the other scenes that were just fun to cut are were like, um, obviously, there was the the golf uh, driving. I was going to ask you that. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't cut that. So oh. my assistant, I had my assistant cut that and she, Shannon Lynch, and she did a phenomenal job with that. And just being able, you know, she came in and like drooling when the dailies came in and she's like, I, I would really like to cut um, the driving range scene. And I was like, oh yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, definitely. You go take that. Like, I love it. I can't wait to see what you do with it. And, um, and she had a great aggressive take on it as well. 
Um, and, uh, and it was a great cut. And then we worked through with the producers and, um, and there were some changes obviously that always get made here and there. Um, but, uh, but I just, I, I thought it really, uh, I thought it came out really well and, uh, people have really responded to that scene. Yeah. I mean, For... I, I, again, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. What were you gonna say? I said, I, I talked about that with Kim as well. I, I mean, I couldn't really talk about it at the time because the show hadn't come out. Um, uh, but we kind of just touched the, on the, the surface that how that was one of the best scenes in the entire series among, you know, several others. Yeah. Yeah, no. And, um, and it does, you know, Kim was right. Like it does call attention. The, the shooting style calls attention to itself, but yeah. the entire series to me feels self-reverential. And so that is within the world of this show, it's completely acceptable. You know, um, yeah. that first kitchen, um, baking fighting scene lets you know what the tone of this show is and some people were surprised by it some people didn't quite know what to make of it and maybe it took them another episode to realize like oh i thought i was watching this show but really i'm watching this show and um and that's you know that's always the challenge of cutting a pilot is to try to find ways to try to just like yeah. hang a lantern and say no this is what you're watching this is what you're watching relax it's going to be great let's just keep watching this and I think it's also, like you said, it's important to set the rules in any 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 world that these are the rules, even if they're not believable. Once yeah. you establish them, then people forget about, you know, this is not realistic or that's not realistic. Majority of the people kind of go along with, on the ride. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and certainly for Brother Son, it was, important, it was important that you know that, all right, let's not take it too seriously. Let's just yeah. enjoy it, you know, and let's have a lot of fun because the actors are having fun. We're going to have fun. We want you to have fun. You talked about uh, your team, uh, right? And from from an editorial standpoint, do you is this pretty much the team that you work with more or less the same all the time, or does it change? How how if it does, how does how does that process work? Just in general. Yeah, um, I've been really lucky in a lot of ways, uh, and one of them is that I've had excellent assistants. And one of the ways that that's not particularly lucky is that you 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 grow them you help them and then they move on and start cutting and yeah. so this was actually the first series i ever worked with shannon and uh but we hit it off right away and we felt um in tune certainly stylistically in tune um so much so that i i handed her you know a really big sequence from from the third episode that i cut so um so even though we haven't worked together for a long time we did get a shorthand pretty quickly and we're able to you know trust each other and uh and find a way to 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 collaborate and so i'm working and, with her again so she's come with me to this next show good i was gonna ask you that that that's the thing right like you just build that rapport and that shorthand and you have that chemistry and connection and it just works yeah for sure absolutely and i've and I, i've definitely had situations where I did not have that and I'm you have sure to find you, <laughs> you just have to you have to find a way out and you have to find a solution and and generally everyone probably knows you know and so um you have some tough conversations here and there but um yeah but when that works it's great yeah and that's okay too because you know not everybody gets along in every single way like everybody has different personalities and traits and stuff so it just depends on that too and it's okay if it doesn't work as long as you understand that and you just, yeah. you know, go on, go on your own way. Yeah, and I think it's also important that people find the right people for them. So, like, I have a certain taste level and tone level and expectation, not only of the work that I would like someone to do for me. I mean, a lot of assistant work is sort of organizational and... Um, but mm. that's not the money work. I mean, that's important because I want to be able to get started early or whatever. I have the rhythms I have and the way that I feel that I can contribute the most uh, uh, creatively. But... The real stuff is saying, when I ask you to do sound work, what level does it come back to me at? And does that help me tell the story? Are you paying attention to story when you do the sound work? Are you helping, are you choosing music that is in the world that we're trying to establish or are you just choosing a song? And so when, if, if somebody is not choosing stuff that is totally correct for my tastes, it, it, they'll be, they'll do better when they're with an editor who aligns more closely to them. So moving on is not, it's just moving on. It's not even good or bad, really. Yeah. What was the last film that you directed? When was it? I've only directed television. And so I worked on a show oh, called Rizzoli and Isles, which was a, 
it was a like a murder cop procedural and so i directed a couple of those and then i worked on it when i was the last five years or so before i got onto brother son i was working for john wells on shameless the last few seasons of shameless and at the same time i was working on um the five seasons of a show called animal kingdom which was for tnt and so i directed three animal kingdoms and so they were um those were like heist shows and they're a southern california crime family and so it was, it was heavy drama um and fun action to direct and on projects like those is that something that you show interest that you want to do it or is it when they're looking for directors i mean that happens in a lot of shows right like you have an actor direct an episode like breaking bad or star trek is it more so because they're looking for different directors or is it something that you showed interest in no as you would as you um i'm sure you know you have to want it and you have to go yeah. after it and you have to let yeah. people know at every turn so my first interview on animal kingdom i was saying to them i just directed on my last show and i want to direct on your show now i fully don't expect you to give me a directing gig on the first season i work with you but you're gonna in three months you're gonna love me and so i want to know that when you do <laughs> i have a shot at directing something and usually the answer is of course yeah sure let's just you know and then you have your relationships and then you just um and you have to remind them you know you got to remind you got to do everything like anything you you if you want it you got to go get it so you got to go and remind them that you want to yeah. do it and and not only do i want to do it i want to do it next season too and i and i want to if you'll give it to me you know like you just got to keep pressing forward yeah. um and uh and so yeah so that was i mean i love editing and i love directing i i am a much more experienced editor so everyone wants me as an editor and i try to leverage that to try to get more directing work yeah. No, I the thing is the reason sometimes I'm asking these questions that I know the answer is for the audience. They don't Of course, of course. Right, right. Um and 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 the cool thing about you know doing all these things is that it just builds it not that you need confidence, you know. I think we at the same time we always need confidence all the time just to maintain that. So there's no room left for, you know, self-doubt or should I be able to do this? And it, it and it and it goes hand in hand. It pushes you to become a better editor and it pushes you to become a better director. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I am, uh, I like, I like to think I know everything, right? I don't know everything, you but have, I like, you have, I, to. Yeah. I, you have to go in the, you know, I call it my cut, you know, it's, it's not my cut. It's a collaborative cut. I call it my cut and I make every decision in that cut. And there's a reason for that decision. And, I can defend every decision in my cut. Now, I'm not going to fight anyone. You have to hold on tightly to every decision you make because you want to make the strongest decision for the for the project and for the story. And so you need to have strength in your conviction and have made a choice that is interesting, hopefully. And when it when you turn it in and it becomes someone else's cut, your director, your producer, whatever, the network, you have to let go and say it is their cut. And I am going to execute their notes as if they're my own. And so, and so that you do as good a job on that note that is terrible, a terrible note, but you execute it like you love it. And, uh, and, and, and that's how you have to move through your cut. And that, at least that's how I move through my cut. And I think that comes to a time, right? Like, you know, when you're starting out or anybody and you get that feedback and do executing that feedback would be a lot difficult in the beginning as opposed to 10 years into your career or 20 years ago because you've seen how things work and how they flow absolutely and what you really try to i mean certainly what i try to do is you know my it's so hard because it's like wait a minute is this my taste or have i just been shifted over because i understand how this process works and i know uh i've seen if you shoot if they're shooting it like this i can read the tea leaves they're going to want this they're going to want that they're going to want this they're going to want that okay so let me put that together okay now let me make that the strongest i can be oh i really started to like this now do i like this because it's i'm i'm really executing their vision in a way that is the best version of that maybe, maybe i don't know <laughs> or am i in line with the way that they're directing maybe you know it's a little bit of both um so it's important um to uh i mean every even shannon she cut the uh the the driving range scene and she loved her cut i loved her cut i thought it was great her first cut fantastic we had notes she had to change them 
I watched her boil over. <laughs> I watched smoke come out of her ears. I said, at once everyone left, I said, I see the smoke is coming out of your ears. You just have to get used to it and let's embrace what it is. And then, you know, I, I forget when it was, it was probably longer than it would have taken, you know, myself, but she came back and she was like, you know, I've had enough time away from the cut. I watch the way it's now it lives. And I think it's very good the way it is. And I was like, that's, that's fantastic. That's great. But learning how to manage those expectations and, you know, you know, I, I, I've cut many scenes where I, I really struggle because whatever the footage is lacking in some fashion, who knows why. And so, and I'm just like, oh, they better not mess with this edit because it's just the only way it can work. And when they do, like, I'm just like, oh, you only, you only think you know what you're talking about. And then I go and I need it and I massage it some other way and it works the other way too, you know? So again, you have to have the conviction of, of making it work in a way, in what you think may be the only way, and you have to have the openness to, to change it. Yeah, and I think one of the things that you said, it kind of nails everything. When you're starting out in your career, or even you know whichever part of the career you have, if there's a tight budget, and if there is, that's all they have in terms of shots, it's amazing how much you are able to push yourself without knowing that what you can make out of what you have available. You know, yeah. like when you're making a, when you're making, I remember making a film on eight millimeter and it was obviously it's film stock, no clue how the hell it's going to come out. And you, you know, you realize that how much t you have to pay extra to process that film. So you better make most of it instead of taking multiple takes over and over again. Yeah. 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 You know, it's just so interesting. And I'm sure you found this in your own career where, you you decide it has to be one thing and then it then something something messes it up and all of a sudden Always. creativity comes in and saves the day and you're like yeah. well what if this scene was like this and what if this scene oh if it's like that what if we just i mean maybe if we just did this and we did that and then maybe we could just land the plane over here and it's going to work maybe even better and it's just so exciting uh when when that happens and you know reality television taught me that a lot because in reality television, they, you know, they, depending on what it is, if it's literally just reality, like people are living their lives for a week and then you're trying to cut together and you're trying to make a story happen. And then you're like, well, I do have, I do have that piece where they drove into the barn and I have that piece where they were sitting in silhouette. And, and then I have this conversation from over here. And what if I put that conversation as they drive into the barn and then continue it under the silhouette? Maybe that's going to work. And it does, you know, and you just, you're so excited about the literally the I mean the the tangible just like putting those pieces together and then revealing it to yourself and then with the emotional journey that the viewer goes on and uh, and 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 those are the those are the things that get me excited. Yeah, did you have you ever felt like with your background reality and other TV shows that you have done coming from that world like uh, not talking about Nip Tuck coming from that kind of a world into the scripted world, I would imagine it's a lot easier to make that transition as opposed to going from the scripted world to the other one. Yeah, it, it seems that that's the case. I think that um, in talking to producers, you know, when you're cutting reality show, you know, like I said, I, I started in news and like long format documentaries, yeah. and then I started cutting reality, and then I started cutting always my fate, my love, my, what I would watch when I got home was scripted stuff. But you have, you have the opportunities and connections you have and you take the journey you take. And, but generally you have to be more creative and you have more footage to get through in the documentary world. Mm -hmm. And it's not shot sometimes with a specific purpose. And so you have to create purpose and you, what would you, and the most critical thing is you want to create design. And so how do you make something look like it was designed that maybe wasn't? And then of course with scripted stuff, you know, there's 120 people on the, um, on the, on the crew, like I was talking about brother son, all working towards the design. And so if you're, 
working on stuff that is already designed and you're trying to you know smooth it and tr and make it feel the best it can and then you go to stuff that has absolutely no design whatsoever and it just sort of looks like a patchwork quilt and you're not really sure what to, how to manage it and you got to go through all this footage and wait a minute i can usually get through about seven pages of dailies in a day but i mean I, what is that how does that translate into like did i watch two days worth of raw footage and then i was able to cut together four scenes and so that the pace at which I cut reality TV and the pace at which I was able to watch footage, process footage, make notes on footage, and then return to that footage and come up with a, a plan of how I was gonna cut it and just make decisions. What you really learn is how to make a decision mm -hmm. and then throw stuff away. I mean, the reality, there's so much stuff that doesn't make the cut. And you gotta just go, oh, that's cool, we don't need it. You better remember, remember it because when you get a note, it might help you solve that problem. And then when you get to scripted stuff, you just, you know, you have less footage to deal with and presumably there's a design and there's also even a script to follow, you know? Yeah. So, and, yeah. and then, and then, and then every reality person I've ever talked to, every producer will say, oh, hey, uh, some scripted guy wants to work on the show, but I'm nervous because the last three guys, they burned out really quickly. And I go, yeah, yeah. I get it. So that's, that's, yeah. so I, I think you're right. Yeah. What would you like to do more in the future or would you like to continue your mix of you know different projects and different genres yeah i think i i think you know the one thing i haven't been able to do is i haven't been able to cut a feature and i think i'd like to cut a feature i think that that's just a different challenge i think that you know i cut about eight hours of television a year and so some part like a like a small part of me like the, that came out of reality television and that cut scripted television and says like how can i spend a year on two hours like what are you talking about mm. and um and then there's the other side of me which knows exactly what i could spend those two years on i can i can i can make it more elegant i can make it more intimate i can make it more personal and um and i would i would just really be excited to to do that. So if I if I if if I were to say in five years that we're gonna have a conversation again, hopefully it'll be about a, a feature film I've, I've cut. Would you ever edit your own feature that you would direct? No, I mean I y the answer is y yes and no. So uh, because <laughs> there's, I won't. I mean it, it doesn't matter. But so the first TV show I directed, um, I had an editor who was fantastic. This and and. But it's so challenging. I mean, you're an editor, you know, as well as director. So it's just so challenging to sit behind somebody else. You can have yeah. conversations. You know, I, I've read all, I'm sure you have too. I've read all of Walter Murch's books. Yeah. And, they, it, and he and Anthony Minghella have these like really pleasant, lovely conversations around pasta dinners. And then he goes off and he, and he goes and he solves problems. And like, um, that's the only way you i sort of feel like i could really work well with an editor i can't sit behind another editor because i would just want to do it myself and so i had a lot of challenges on the second episode i directed because one of my assistants was promoted in, entirely to cut the show i was directing and i sat there and i looked at him and he looked at me and he was like do you want to sit here and do it and i'm like well a little bit a little bit i do but i think it's better if we you know do it together and um, and we made it through, but I definitely value what the editor does and having another point of view. I know exactly the way I think it should start, and I think that it's important. And when directors do it to me and they say, hey, man, this is great. I love what you've done. But, and they don't say this, but they say it without saying it, but you've solved problems. I'm not convinced they're problems yet. So let's go back to the way that I designed it and so that we can both see the problems again and we can solve them together and sometimes the they'll they'll watch those and they'll say oh i see why you did that oh yes that was the better solution and we go there and sometimes we come up with the third or fourth option that that works just as well if not better and so i think that if you do it yourself you you might I don't know. I feel like I've just been doing it for so long. I could probably identify all the problems myself or certainly in those collaborative meetings with assistants or bring in other people to watch and in conversation, come up with a plan. But I'm a strong editor and I hope I help my directors. And so I would, why wouldn't I want that brain to collaborate with on my stuff? Do yeah. you, what do you, what do you do? And how do you, what do you think? I, I edited my first feature that was, merely feature documentaries merely because of the budget reason and also because i love editing i'm like i'm gonna edit it 
Um, mm. And then the second and the third one. Do you, that do I did you think sign. that that was a good idea? No. Oh. So the second and third one, I really wanted an editor. Again, it was a little bit, it was better budget, but it was a little tight. So what I did was I did it myself in a rough cut. Then I brought an editor on board and she and I over during COVID worked over Zoom in a, in a getting her notes and stuff. And I kind of went and implemented them. And that worked because I enjoyed it too. Plus at the same time, I had an, somebody else who was there with me. And I think, and I think a lesson that I learned that, from that was after directing like any feature that I direct, I wouldn't mind being like a second editor just so that I'm there. At least that's the mentality that I have right now. But having somebody else doing it does make your life easier because you've got, you know, as a director, you've got so many things going on. You got so many things to handle. And then if you're a producer on top of it, then good luck. You know, like there's so many things. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I feel right now. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I, that sounds right to me. I mean, I'll tell you, you know what I hate doing? Cutting dailies. So like if, if, uh, yeah, I, if somebody got me a first cut and then we just talked about it, had a nice, lovely pasta dinner, that would be great. I would love that. And if, you know, sometimes I'd be like, you know what, let me take a whack at this sequence or whatever. I, I think I would find that pretty enjoyable. Yeah. Um, hard to know. You know, and I think that, um, but I do think that the more eyeballs, the more collaborative eyeballs, not just eyeballs, I get plenty of notes from people who are just eyeballs and they're just noting to note. Um, but uh, real collaboration is so valuable. And so I think, you know, like you said, you had another person who you were able to talk to and work through a sequence. It just, it, it, there's no downside to that. Yeah. And also, I think one thing that we talked about earlier was that connection that you must have with the editor in terms of your point of view. Not mm. necessarily that he or she may have to agree with you, but just enough to counter you, but enough to understand you. And I think, again, it's that synergy, that marriage. If that works, then you are you have that built that relationship where you're willing to take criticism, but you're also willing to tell the editor, this is what I want, because, again, at the end of the day, that's your vision, but willing yeah. to take it and then kind of balance it. It's hard, but I think that's that's what at least I enjoy the most is yeah. just you know, doing it together. And at the end of the day, it's all about the story. Like anything that makes the film great, I'm down yeah. for that. Yeah. It's always a lesson, a lesson in like patience you learn. and humility, yeah. you know, and you it's learn. just like, yeah. I just, I want to feel this one out and, and also depending on what your relationships are. So you could have a relationship with one editor that, that at which point that works really well and another, and maybe you need to take the reins a little bit more. It's just such a, it's such a fun job to do. And to be able to spend your life connecting to characters and helping design ways to tell their stories that people respond to. So, uh, yeah. So if it's with two people, five people, 20 people, it's, it's all great. Yeah. Awesome, man. Um, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. Unless you want to add anything else. Uh, I mean, I had a great time talking to you about obviously the series, but obviously just in general about filmmaking. Um, would would love to chat with you again uh, maybe on the project that you're working on right now sure yeah no it's been great talking to you for an hour and um and like i said i listened to kim's and i thought that was a really fun uh podcast as well and i'll continue to listen to the others that i hadn't uh, i hadn't heard yet awesome man thank you so much talk yeah soon. thank you nice meeting all you. right take care likewise bye-bye i hope you enjoyed this episode thank you so much for watching and listening don't forget to subscribe like share and comment and do come back for another episode. Until then, have a great day.